I am Patrick Watson, the University Director of the Salises, part of the organizing uh, team involved in this conference, and we are extremely pleased to be part of that organizing uh, committee, and we are extremely pleased to have Professor Sachs here, and we promise you an intellectual treat that you will enjoy thoroughly, and you will have a lot to say to many people in time to come about this, about this exercise. So I am going to go straight into the, uh, the matter. I am going to call on David uh, Smith, who is head of the, one of the other uh, organizing, and he's going to go, he's in a hurry, so I'm going to bring him immediately, and you'll say who you are. Uh, and he's going to say a few words, and he's going to formally introduce Professor Sachs, and then we'll have the discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Prof. Um, my name is David Smith. I'm the coordinator for the Institute for Sustainable Development at the University of the West Indies, and also the coordinator for the Caribbean part of the uh, UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And as many of you probably know, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network is headed by Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who um, is one of the people who you could legitimately say needs no introduction, but since they asked me to do so, I will introduce him anyway. He's a world-renowned professor of economics and a leader in sustainable development. As I had indicated before, yes, he is the director of the UN, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and has been a special advisor to the United Nations past secretary generals and is a special advisor to the current secretary general on the sustainable development goals. He has in the past been the director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University in New York and is currently the director of the Center for Sustainable Development and a university professor at Columbia University. Prior to this, he spent something over 20 years at Harvard University as a professor. He's a best-selling author, a syndicated columnist. You'll find his articles in columns in more than 100 countries. And his most recent book, which I think came out, was it last year? Building the New American Economy, Smart, Fair, and Sustainable. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the distinguished lecturer for the Caribbean Action 2030 Regional Conference on the Sustainable Development Goals, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. I'd like to thank uh, all who are involved in putting on this very important conference for the wonderful success of mobilizing the interest throughout this community, uh, throughout the Caribbean region, and also throughout the United Nations. And I want to thank my colleagues at the United Nations also for contributing to this important meeting and brainstorming. It's really well, it's always a great pleasure for me to be at UWI and in this room, uh, which I know well, uh, and uh, this great university, this wonderful country. Uh, I always come, and I hope uh, today will be the same, uh, in a spirit of wanting to learn from you uh, about the challenges and ways that we, especially in the international academic community, and I, in this context, represent the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which David Smith uh, heads uh, for us in this region, and we're very, very grateful. Uh, and also, uh, on behalf of uh, the UN and the UN Secretary General, ways that we can help uh, this region to achieve its purposes. And we heard very inspiring words already from the Prime Minister, and he gave me uh, good advice on better book titles. Uh, rather, rather than the end of poverty, it should have been the age of prosperity, and I would have <laughs> sold more books. Uh, but uh, I take the point, uh, and um, we really did hear a very eloquent and very, very talented political leader talk about uh, the vision for the year 2030. I think that that is our starting point, not only because the United Nations adopted sustainable development goals, which 
you see everywhere in the building and uh, on display for the year 2030, but because it's really important to have goals and goals that have dates and uh, goals that are bold because that's a mobilizing factor for society. A few days ago, I was actually at a wonderful gathering in Norway uh, that brought together astronomers and uh, physicists and uh, three of the astronauts from the U.S. moonshot uh, program, from the Apollo program, uh, to meet and discuss the future of humanity. And we spent a lot of time talking about President John F. Kennedy's goals which he recommended to the American people in 1961 when he said, I believe that this country should adopt the goal before the end of this decade of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. And that was something that we remember half a century later. I certainly do. I was seven, but I remember it uh, because then I followed all through my youth that drama and indeed, before the end of the decade, in just eight years, uh, there was a man walking on the moon, uh, indeed several of them, uh, and uh, brought safely back to Earth. That's inspiration. And I actually came yesterday from uh, a meeting of the RFK Foundation, Human Rights Foundation, in Hyannisport, which was the summer White House of the Kennedy administration and there was memorabilia all over and the the genius of the Kennedy leadership was setting goals uh, and then inspiring people to realize we could meet those goals even if they seem pretty tough like going to the moon and back in eight years when they had no idea how to do it by the way so it wasn't that this was all okay off the shelf now we follow the directions this was really scrambling for eight years <coughs> by bringing the best minds and a lot of energy and a lot of financial commitment around these purposes. I think that's, in general, an important strategy, a good one. Set clear goals for a country. I'm trying to encourage the United States right now to do the same, of course, around the Sustainable Development Goals. We don't think ahead. Uh, we are limited to 140 character strategies. Uh, it's a little bit of a problem. So uh, we need a little bit longer term thinking. Uh, we also need 20, 30 goals. Many of the problems that you're facing, uh, we're facing in the United States. Many of the problems you're facing, we caused you to face, unfortunately, also, which is a, a different dimension of this. But we're facing a lot of the problems of inequality, a lot of the questions of job creation for young people, especially in an age when technology is changing very, very fast. How to achieve quality education for all children. We're obviously in the midst of a national debate, one could say almost a mental breakdown over SDG3, uh, which is universal uh, health care. Thank God they decided not to vote on some horrendous anti-SDG3 legislation yesterday, <laughs> which would have taken 22 million people off the health rolls, just the opposite, actually, of the idea of universal health coverage. But the public revolted, said, no way, you know, it was a bunch of uh, rich corrupt bosses that want their taxes cut. And so they said, okay, we'll throw 22 million people off the payroll and they won't notice. And uh, we'll do it without one day of hearings, one day of testimony, we'll do it in secret. Then we'll release it at the last moment, then we'll vote and then we'll have a big celebration that we've uh, overthrown Obamacare. Except that the public was horrified. And it didn't take more than 48 hours afterwards to have a nationwide rebellion. No, thank you. And so Mr. McConnell, who was the mastermind of this really uh, awful idea, 
had to back down yesterday. We're still in a fight, by the way. So all of this is to say the fight for justice and development is nonstop, all the time, everywhere. And uh, nobody's got, almost nobody's got this right. Maybe Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. Uh, but, but almost nobody else, almost nobody else has this right. We're all trying to figure this out. And some people are trying to undermine it, actually, uh, because this agenda is not for everybody, everybody. If you happen to be the owner of a giant coal company, this probably is not your favorite agenda because there's no future for coal in a safe climate world. If you happen to be David and Charles Koch, two famous uh, libertarians in the United States who finance a lot of anti-government action and propaganda, they own a big oil and gas industry. So they don't really like SDG 13, uh, which is to stop human-made climate change. And so they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars to fight that. And the reason why Donald Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement is not because he doesn't believe in climate science. He doesn't care. <laughs> That's not his issue. It's because 22 senators wrote to him the week before to say pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement, and all 22 of them are on the pay of the oil and gas industry. So that's how it works. So this is a, a real struggle. And we have to figure out, in the midst of this, we just have humanity on our side uh, because we've got a lot more votes. They've got a lot more money. And that's the deal. So that's what we're trying to figure out. Uh, and these goals are really quite important. Uh, actually, it's true to say that for the Caribbean, uh, the climate change issue is an existential issue. It's, it's not one that you're going to be able to determine. Uh, it's one that is going to affect the fate of this region outside of your control, and not for the first time in the history of this region. Of course, not entirely out of your control because I want to work with you and people around the world want to work with you so that your voice is better heard and better represented in the debate, and so that when a president of the United States says, oh, we don't care about the Paris Climate Agreement, the other 192 countries say, what the hell? And say, of course we care, because this is the future of the world. And that, in the end, is going to win also, by the way. Because it doesn't really, I mean, it matters a lot what, what a president does, but in the end, we are absolutely all going to be working together to stop climate change because it would be devastating for the world if this runs out of control. And so even if American political corruption slows the process a little bit, it's not going to stop the right thing to do. So we have to find our voice really, especially uh, loudly in this context. Well, you have lots of challenges, uh, as you know, and I'm hardly an expert on them, though I am uh, trying to be as helpful as I can. And I want to discuss with you for a few minutes some of my perspectives of especially the economic future for the region and areas where I think special efforts can be made that can be successful, and then some of the strategies that might be adopted to help finance those strategies, because the basic name of the game in all economics is invest. You have to invest in the future. That's where all progress comes from, whether it's investing in education, investing in infrastructure, investing in new businesses. It's mobilizing resources. Nothing really comes for free. The closest we get to something coming for free is the great new idea or the great technological breakthrough. And fortunately, there's a lot of that around. So there's no shortage of good opportunities right now in the world. We're not 
at the end of advancement of technology or science. We're actually in the middle of a real revolution, a hugely positive revolution of technological advance, some of which I think works perfectly for the Caribbean region. The information technologies, the advances in renewable energy, these are just uh, perfect opportunities, I think, for you to really uh, take advantage. So let me say a few words about my perceptions of the economic challenge and then some ways that it can be addressed and some ways that it can be financed and then open it up for, for discussion. By and large, the future economic growth of this region, I believe, it's not a hugely insightful statement, but I believe it's a correct one, will be in the service economy. So this is an economy that in its history, of course, grew in the rural areas first uh, as uh, sugar plantations and slave labor, uh, and uh, was developed uh, with the mining sector afterwards, bauxite and other mining. It was a commodities sector driven by colonial power interests. And that's how the economy evolved. And if we looked back at the time of independence of this country and others in the region, the societies were still relatively rural societies. And the economic strategy was still relatively commodity-based strategies. What can we sell abroad? Then the next wave came of tourist development which has been the lead service sector for economic growth, a very important one, and, a, and on the whole, a very beneficial one if, if it's done well, because it creates jobs and incomes and human pleasure, uh, and, uh, and uh, it has all good possibilities if the environmental downsides and other consequences uh, are, are properly managed. Of course, there is still some future and necessarily in agriculture. There is still activity in the mining sector. Uh, there is still uh, future income growth, at least, uh, in the tourist sector as it upgrades and higher value per visitor and more visitors, so there's still progress to be made there. But I believe that these sectors cannot carry the kind of economic development over the next 15 to 20 years, nor the job creation by themselves. And indeed, in the commodity sectors, jobs really are disappearing in general, everywhere in the world. The mining sector doesn't employ people. Uh, more and more, it's just an automated sector uh, in any event. We have a purported fight over coal mining jobs in the United States, but there are fewer than 20,000 coal miners in all of the United States now uh, in a labor force of 152 million people. Because if there are still coal mines operating, they're basically being managed by or being run autonomously by massive uh, earth movers and massive trucks that drive themselves. And that is more and more the way that all, uh, almost all physical production is taking place. So mechanization and uh, uh, smart systems mean that jobs in the materials producing sectors will shrink. And Donald Trump, you know, in our context is trying to create a lot of jobs in American manufacturing, but don't believe it because even even if there's more production, there won't be more jobs because the whole uh, manufacturing uh, industry is becoming more and more automated, smarter and smarter robots. It's just not where any of the jobs on net will be created. And often you hear of multi-billion dollar new uh, factories uh, going, or sometimes you do, going up in the U.S. in high-tech sectors. And then you look and it's 100 jobs or 500 jobs. Again, 
in our context, that's th out of 325 million people. It just doesn't create the kind of employment. So I believe that the employment future in this country will be increasingly in the service sector and that the Caribbean will be increasingly an urban-based society. This is the natural process of development and uh, I would expect, I'm making up numbers, uh, so don't take them too seriously, but it would be reasonable that three quarters of the population would be living in urban areas by 2050, for example. Uh, and that would be rather normal and most of those jobs, almost all of them will be service economy jobs. And so that raises uh, the questions of what, what does that uh, mean? Well, the most basic thing it means, and every speaker has said it so far, is that quality of education will be the number one, number two, and number three determinants of future economic development. There's just nothing, it, the service economy depends on literate, numerate, uh, healthy young people. And that means the quality of education and the ability to have a good, safe childhood uh, and a good environment for child raising and the expectation of every child we're going to, at, of course, finish high school at least, but then go on to some kind of tertiary education, whether it's advanced vocational training or university degree. This has to be the most basic norm of every society. There's really no other way that I can see that it's going to be possible for any country. I'm speaking, I say this about the United States every day also, but no other way for any country to be able to be ensuring that there will be jobs for young people, that they will be able to find gainful employment, uh, and that uh, the economy will be able to promote uh, competitive uh, sector. The second sine qua non for services, of course, is decent infrastructure. And so that means uh, quality uh, electricity supply, because everything we do is uh, dependent completely on connectivity uh, and on uh, increasingly on clean electricity. A good broadband network is now not just uh, necessary for being able to stream a movie, but it's uh, necessary for an economy to function. And so ubiquitous quality broadband is part of the fundamental economic infrastructure. And of course, a good transport system. Uh, both the roads, uh, the inter-island travel, uh, the uh, aviation, it's, it's all a basic part of the package. Uh, none of this is uh, new, but it's a checklist that absolutely needs to be on, uh, you know, delivered on time. I'll come back to the question of how to, how to pay for it, uh, but in terms of actually doing it, I think it's, uh, it, it's really important. Third, of course, is physical security. Uh, and that is uh, safety for people and safety for visitors and safety, a sense of safety uh, in general in the society. And this is a big challenge. And again, where I'd say if you weren't living so close to the US and uh, with all of the ills that then spill over uh, to the Caribbean, whether it was the drug trafficking or is the drug trafficking or the other illegal operations that are set up on the fringes of the United States to take advantage of a huge illegal market in the United States, no doubt, and all the guns that come from the United States, because last time I checked, you're not manufacturing lots of guns here. Uh, so they must be coming from somewhere, and I would guess uh, that I know where 
because uh, we love guns in the United States. Not I, but uh, some of uh, my fellow countrymen and some of the people who produce them are the politically most powerful people in the United States. And uh, they're pretty damn relentless. Uh, and uh, I won't go into it. Uh, <laughs> it it's really unbelievable. Uh, so how to create, this is what I want to hear more about also, uh, how to create conditions for physical security, get the weapons out. I noticed today, by the way, today was, uh, I think, a New York Times story about the FARC uh, disarming and the uh, great containers filled with the rifles and the other weapons uh, closing up. and. One question is uh, um, how we could get all of your guns back into those containers uh, uh, through, I was thinking of something like a debt for gun swap or something like that, uh, that uh, you get a uh, billion dollars of debt written off uh, and uh, you use some of those proceeds to buy up these uh, guns and you tell the United States don't ship the next uh, shipment. Uh, to us, uh, and you try to uh, clean up the this, this situation here. There probably are ways to do it. Colombia is a great inspiration for us. They've been fighting for 70 years. They're giving up the guns. Maybe President Santos can come give some good advice also, because he's been uh, well engaged in, in the negotiations. But security is a third, uh, third major uh, component. And of course, you have both uh, geographical uh, difficulties, for instance, being in the, uh, in the path of, uh, of the drug trafficking and uh, the gangs uh, linked to US gangs and so forth. But you also have some wonderful geographical advantages, like being in one of the most beautiful places on the planet. That's a good place to start. Uh, and uh, that obviously brings a lot of people here and can bring a lot more people here that want to be here. And proximity to the US is not all bad. Uh, there are also some advantages to it as well in terms of proximity to markets in a way that I uh, want to discuss. And there's a vast diaspora, uh, a vast di a Caribbean diaspora, which means that you're really an interconnected society over a very large area. And that's good in an age of globalization as well. And that, I believe, can be tapped tremendously for development. So what kinds of jobs could come in the future in the service sector? Well, many, many, but I want to mention uh, a couple that are already underway, but I think could play uh, an even bigger role uh, in the future. Let me give one example. We're debating health care in the United States. We're spending in the U.S. a ridiculous sum per person on health care. It's about $10,000 per man, woman, and child in the United States per year on health care. It's twice the cost of any other high-income country in the world. Our health care system is so overpriced, it's beyond imagining. It's a bunch of monopoly conditions. And the health care industry is super profitable because they've jacked up prices beyond anything reasonable. I had to get an MRI for a shoulder that had been pulled out just recently. And when the insurance had not yet cleared for that, they said they couldn't do it. And I said, no, it's just a short procedure. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll pay if I need to. I have to. I'm, was about to fly off to uh, someplace, and I said, I'll work it out with the insurance company later. And they said, no, we can't do that. This little procedure, which was less than 30 minutes, we're going to charge you $8,000 for it. 
Uh, and uh, that's how the American healthcare system works. There's a medicine which cures uh, hepatitis C, which is a wonderful medicine called Sofospovir, and it's owned by a company which didn't invent it, but they bought the patent. So they own the patent, uh, the company is Gilead, and it costs one dollar a pill to make. You take one pill a day for seven weeks, so it's 84 pills. It's $84 to make a treatment dose. You know how much they charge? List price? $84,000. So we have three million people in the United States that are infected but can't get treatment right now. Okay, so here's my idea. Outside of the United States, you know how much it costs to buy a treatment dose? A hundred bucks. So why don't you set up a hep C treatment site here? Clinics. People could fly in, have a nice weekend. Actually, they'd spend uh, seven weeks, get cured, and they would save a fortune an absolute fortune, all within international law completely, all within international trade rules. If the United States wants to overcharge its healthcare system by many times, here you are. So it's sometimes called medical tourism, but I wouldn't call it that exactly. I would just call it medical treatment for 300 million people that pay too much in their own country and who would like a nice place to come, get their treatment, and uh, enjoy themselves. And the point I'm making is that, to my mind, is not outlandish. That, to my mind, is just normal business opportunity. Of course, you need to train professionals who can help with that but it would also be foreign capital coming in. Doesn't have to be US capital by any means. It can be from any country. Could be Chinese clinics, it could be French clinics, it could be any clinics. But you could offer services at much, much lower cost on a short plane ride from the United States on a large scale you would help us drive down our health care costs, too. <laughs> but I do think that that's the kind of service industry, global, competitive, tapping into a $20 trillion market that can create a lot of good jobs in the future. Consider the university sector. I don't really want to tell you, but I will that my university, Columbia University, room and board for one year, I think it's, uh, I may not be completely up to date, I'm on sabbatical, but I think it's $60,000. That's a little pricey, more maybe, maybe 70. Somebody have a kid there? <laughs> <laughs> well, UWI could provide a high quality, four-year degree at a tiny fraction of that, and should. And that's not only good education, that's actually a market as well. And as you know, the market for higher education is a worldwide, globalized market now. And countries, and it's the top universities, there's nothing demeaning about it, the top universities are competing for internationally mobile students, and I see that everywhere in the world. So that's self-financing because people pay for both of those. Of course, there's some upfront capital, but that's what the capital markets can do against a good business plan. And I was really thrilled to hear how UWI is taking on the particular challenges of sustainable development, which I know to be the case firsthand. And that is a, 
an area of education that students want to pay for. We have hundreds of students coming to pay a lot of money for a master's degree in this subject because it's important for their future, because they can get jobs in it. It's, I wouldn't say it's business, because we like to think of it as a social contribution, but what I am saying is it's an economic sector that is an absolutely valid expansion sector for this region. Of course, there are many, many other areas where the service sector works beautifully uh, and they're obvious culture sports of course building on uh, the the great uh, tourism traditions any country that is home to both bob marley and usain bolt uh, should be able to uh, be world leaders in sports and culture, right? So what about great music festivals? Uh, what about other ways uh, in great sports academies uh, and uh, ways to train future athletes in other areas? I think it's all absolutely within reach. What I'm saying is that we need to think creatively. The old sectors are not done and gone. They play a role. The traditional sectors continue to generate incomes and rents, but they're not enough. And they're not enough for the aspirations of the society. And they're not providing the quality jobs for young people. And so it's going to be new sectors, and I believe largely new service economy uh, sectors uh, that we should be brainstorming. And as part of our work towards the 2030 agenda, finding ways to uh, examine the options to bring uh, potential investors uh, in sector promotion, to strategize on health and education and other areas because there's tremendous, tremendous opportunity in this. Now, in terms of some of the specific foundations for this, let me mention uh, a couple of things. First, infrastructure. The infrastructure on, uh, in, the, in the Caribbean is, is okay. It's not uh, in horrendous condition by any means, but it needs to be expanded, clearly. And there is still tremendous uh, future growth needed in the energy sector, which is, up until now has been almost entirely an oil and diesel sector. Uh, and yet this is a region with vast renewable energy potential, as everybody knows. And the good news for you is that the costs of solar have plummeted, and they're continuing to plummet. And so now what was out of reach and uneconomic 20 years ago is now absolutely economical and competitive with anything except free petrol. Uh, and uh, you should be basing your future on paid petrol, not free petrol, uh, in any event. And that means that now wind and solar, and especially You've got lots of places for pumped hydro storage. There are lots of technologies now for making the uh, solar energy together with storage uh, the low cost energy supply. So I would hope that UWI and other uh, institutions of uh, technical training could put a lot of focus on building out the renewable energy economy and I believe that it is financeable now because the prices have come down so sharply. There are places in the United States where uh, solar companies are bidding to supply solar at four cents a kilowatt hour, which is uh, already uh, beating the lowest cost fossil fuel alternatives. So there's tremendous potential here and I think that this is one of the obvious areas where 
uh, study, uh, I know studies have been made, but I would put it on a, on a uh, <coughs> high priority track. There are also big advances in offshore wind uh, that are coming fast and engage with Statoil or other companies that are doing offshore wind uh, because we're about to buy a lot of it in uh, offshore uh, New York. Uh, but there's big potential, uh, obviously, in, in uh, the Caribbean region as well. ICTs in general, again, I don't know enough about the plans for the region on broadband coverage and costs, but finding ways to make sure you have ubiquitous, high quality, low cost broadband is now a major international competitive advantage. And if you don't have that yet, you need to demand of the current providers that they give you scale up plans and you need to find ways to bring new providers in to the islands and into the economy. And uh, the Chinese providers are very, very low cost, very competitive, uh, and uh, should definitely be attracted as well uh, as uh, part of the uh, big scale up of, of ICTs. Let me say a word about one of the very tough sides, and that's climate change. This is a real danger, obviously, for this region. And the issues of adaptation are first and foremost for you. How can you remain safe and also show that the infrastructure is safe and that even in a warming world, which we're going to have, and probably with more extreme hurricanes, that this, that, that, uh, this part of the world remains or increases in its safety. With better weather forecasting, nobody needs to die in hurricanes anymore. These are not uh, events that, are, that can't be anticipated. They can be anticipated days beforehand. And when you have a disaster like Matthew, which takes uh, hundreds of lives, this is because of inadequate planning, poverty, lack of awareness, lack of systems. And I think that it should be a major commitment that the number of deaths goes to essentially zero. Because even when there's big storms, there are ways to ensure human safety, especially with a few days' notice. And I think that this should be one of the major considerations. The fact is, however, we're also going to have rising sea levels and more floods and more storm surges. And this, unfortunately, is without question a um, just another one of the visitations to this region, not caused by you at all, that is going to have economic, serious economic uh, um, consequences or responses needed, and a lot of good thinking in, in the coming years. And I want to use that as the segue to the last thing I want to talk about, which is financing. Who pays for all of this? Well. On climate change, the rich countries have to pay. They cause the problem. They're causing damages. They're going to have to pay, Donald Trump notwithstanding. And we're going to have to make a big fuss about that, really a big fuss about that, because the current arrangements are completely unacceptable. And the current arrangements are, well, good luck. Why are you looking at us? Say the rich countries. And even when they negotiated the Paris Climate Agreement, there's a section called losses and damages in which the governments took cognizance of the fact that because the climate's changing, there will be human-induced losses and damages. But the rich countries put in the clause as one of their conditions, this will not be considered as compensation for damages caused by our previous emissions. 
I don't want to stop there. We do need climate justice, and we don't have it yet. When the Caribbean faces incremental costs of adaptation, or when new extreme storms come, and they surely will, and new big floods come, and they surely will, and there are damages associated with them, you should not be the ones that bear that cost ultimately. And, and we're going to have to work at that diplomatically and financially and economically. One part of the solution, by the way, is we absolutely need to move to an insurance system. An insurance system meaning that when the next disaster strikes, the billions of dollars that are needed for repair, rebuilding, or compensation are not just begging or pleading, but are just a payment from a contract. And this is something that we can work towards very practically. That is what the insurance industry does. Of course, there's insurance cover already in this region, but not the comprehensive coverage that in any way is commensurate with the costs that come with these disasters. So my basic idea is, my basic idea is that we move to an insurance arrangement where a significant part of the premiums are paid by the rich countries in relation to the increased damages and therefore the increased premiums that their actions have caused. It's an idea that needs to be debated and discussed and stared down with rich countries, but it's not a crazy idea that we should have both insurance and accountability and some fairness, because we're not going to just, I would never just let you, without voices on the outside, bear these costs without responsibility. So that's an area that I want to work together with you uh, on. Then in terms of finance, private business, there's a lot of capital around. Of course, you have to show the feasibility of the financing, an effort to expand uh, medical services for international uh, patients, an effort to expand the education system, or other areas require business plans by your entrepreneurs or foreign entrepreneurs or, and government saying we're supporting the infrastructure around that. But I believe that there's ample private capital to be found for a lot of those activities because there's a tremendous amount of arbitrage available. But there's also more official financing available. And I do want to make a plug for China. Uh, in this regard, because China is the world's largest bilateral financier of infrastructure. I know you've had some issues. When you negotiate, be careful. Yeah? Uh, also, establish diplomatic relations. First of all, I should say that again. Establish diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China throughout the region, in my humble opinion because uh, that is sensible when the People's Republic of China is first the world's largest economy, second the world's largest trading partner, and third the world's largest financier of infrastructure. Take a trip to Beijing. It's useful. Good. I just was there last week, two weeks ago, for the uh, One Belt, One Road Summit, or I guess it was about a month ago now, and President Xi Jinping gathered dozens of world leaders to talk about the world's largest single infrastructure project. And this is extremely important and extremely relevant for this region as well, because China is a huge saver, and they're investing heavily abroad in infrastructure and in uh, low interest, long-term financing for infrastructure.
let's be creative. There's a short period of time. You have strong political leadership. There's a determination to make a breakthrough. I think a breakthrough really can be at hand because you have technology, market access, new sectors, and a tremendous amount of energy and vision. And so let's use the SDGs for that purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Professor Sachs. Uh, those uh, wonderful words of wisdom, and we are going to follow up on you and ask the United States to pay for some of these things if it is at all, if it is at, at, at all possible. <laughs> yeah. Sure. We go into a period of questions, and we are trying to catch up on some time here. So I'm going to ask, we're going to take three questions at a time. Sylvia Cohenberg at UWI Mona, Department of Language, Linguistics, and Philosophy. Um, you told us that progress requires investment in the future, it makes sense. And you named the quality of education as the number one, number two, and number three determinant of our future success. Um, I want to marry that point with uh, something that PVC Luz Longworth uh, called for this morning, and that is for us to turn UWI into an activist interventionist institution. Um, I, we have a situation in Jamaica where a majority of children who enter the educational system are systematically disadvantaged. These children are marginalized in our English-speaking schools on the basis that their home language is an English-based Creole. This situation is largely responsible for failing educational outcomes. And without intervention, it will continue to hinder our future growth. And the situation is not unique to Jamaica either. It's widespread across the region. So I'm part of a team which, through the kind of action research that Luz called for, aims to address this situation by empowering teachers to teach English language and literacy using methodologies appropriate to a Creole-speaking environment. Um, so I'd love to invite the relevant stakeholders to attend our presentation this afternoon in panel number one. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding um, your recommendation or your pr prediction about Caribbean societies being largely urban-based. Um, what I wanted to find out from you, is it that behind that idea of seeing us as largely urban-based, that um, rural society or rural communities will no longer be relevant? Or what is the plan? You know, what, you know, what do you foresee as the role of persons who don't necessarily want to move to the city? And, all in, and combined to that, how do we then manage things like um, spatial balance? Because we can't all live in, in cities, that's the bottom line. Well, I think that was a great demonstration of uh, gender imbalance in this society. <laughs> the men are terrified to speak, so, uh, and, uh, and the women have the strongest points to make. So uh, I'm uh, very, uh, very appreciative of that. Of course, uh, we need strong leaders, men and women, and that means uh, boys and girls uh, from from the very start, feeling empowered and knowing that they are going to be uh, the leaders uh, when, when they grow up. And I would emphasize again the role of the whole uh, life cycle of from early, earliest childhood onward as being crucial to this story. We know biologically more and more that uh, even what happens during pregnancy, of course, affects the whole life course. Uh, what happens from the earliest days of uh, after birth and infancy matters. And we know now more and more that education starts uh, at birth, of course, and how parents talk to their infants. Uh, and then even in developing cognitive capacities for very young children. And so uh, I got a call on the way here uh, uh, from a colleague in New York to hold a conference on behalf of our mayor's proposal to start. We, he, we had kindergarten, and then he introduced universal pre-K, Mayor de Blasio, a couple of years ago. That was his main campaign promise. 
was uh, that uh, you should start a year before kindergarten. Now he wants to start at for three year olds and four year olds that this should be universally available for all children in New York City. And I think that this is, and so I was discussing with my colleague the evidence base for this and so forth, and it's quite overwhelming, <coughs> very powerful. So the early childhood development is extremely important. Universal access of kids to a safe learning environment from age three or four is really something that every society should be aspiring to. And making sure that every girl and every boy knows that of course they're going to finish at least a high school education and more is something that I think should be a normal part of their lives. On the question of the language of instruction, I'm really thankful for that. I first was not aware of the importance of that issue here, but I can tell you in many other places where we've worked, of course, it won't surprise you to know, it's been crucial. We work in West Africa a lot, and almost no child is trained in the home language, and almost no child's learning properly. By third grade, they're out of it. Uh, they haven't understood what's happening because the teacher is speaking a national language or even a regional language, but the local language is not the language. <coughs> so I am not an expert on this question, and thankfully you are. Um, I'm hoping, by the way, and maybe you could say something about it, that whether uh, online and uh, also using computer, uh, you know, set games or phone apps or other things are ways to help because those can be done in any language, of course, and they could be Creole instruction and Creole-based games in the schools. Even if the teachers, uh, I don't know whether here that's an issue of the teacher's ability to speak the child's home language or not, but in Africa it's a big problem because uh, there are so many local languages. This is a major question. It's no good having kids in school if they're not learning. And so also testing whether their learning is really important. And being part of the international tests and so forth is really, in my view, very, very important as well. So I thank you. I don't have a special knowledge of how to address it, but I do have uh, the knowledge and experience to know how important it is uh, and how the idea that in the earliest years, which are earlier than we used to think, the kids are being instructed in their home language and talked to in their home language so they understand and then gradually uh, move to the, a national language, I think is, uh, is very, very important. Let me say a word about the university's role because that came up. Universities are crucial for economic development now. And that is you know, the most famous iconic case in the world of that is Silicon Valley. And that is made possible not only by the companies there, but by Berkeley, Stanford, University of California at San Francisco. That is a complex of universities and companies together. And that is very, very important for development. So there are more than 40 million people on, uh, in the Caribbean that's lots of campuses needed. That should support lots and lots of campuses of quality higher education, of engineering schools, and so forth. So please, students will pay for that. And not only students from within the region, but international students as well. So build up the higher education base and free it to do unusual things, to be business incubators to create, uh, have professors uh, creating businesses and other things so that you're really getting a lot of the move from the expertise into the economy in, uh, in, in new enterprises as well. And of course, I think the university and business and government should be partnering on major studies all the time. Uh, what is the future of international health services in this economy? What is the future of renewable energy in this economy? 
How could higher education be expanded in this economy? How could we be teaching in local language? Any of these is a great white paper. Uh, in other words, a policy document that goes into the best evidence, that looks at what can be done, that is really present. But that is a tremendous project for government and university and leading businesses to work on together. So we don't do that in the United States, by the way, at all right now. Uh, government doesn't think, obviously. Uh, so we have, uh, we're trying now to see whether we can do it with anarchy and tweets. Uh, <laughs> but I don't, recommend the, I don't recommend the example. A government that thinks, and it's quite clear that your government thinks a lot and thinks hard, is really important. But I would say the university has a huge role to play in helping to do formalized studies on these major areas commissioned by government uh, that can really give the serious look. And don't go to international consultants for this. <laughs> They're expensive. <laughs> They're expensive. They don't know and they don't care. <laughs> really. And that will enable you to do 10 times more studies, because they charge 10 times too much. <laughs> uh, finally, on the question of uh, rural and urban development, if you look at uh, almost every high-income country in the world, it's roughly 80-20 uh, urban-rural. And the reason is, of course, uh, there still are some rural industries, agriculture, and then the services around it. There are mine sites and uh, other uh, kinds of activities. And there are people that want to live in rural areas. But by and large, from an economic point of view, rural areas are tough economically, except for land-based activities. Because most economic activities require face-to-face -face concentrated activities. And therefore, most economic activities are competitive in an urban environment where people are more or less crowded together. And you're always right in the uh, gaze of your competitor or your supplier or your customer. And that's a worldwide 200-year trend. So I think it's a pretty good bet. It doesn't mean to give up. On, and by the way, there are so many advantages of urban areas. With, with distance down, it's easier to provide security, street lighting, safety, transport, broadband, uh, connectivity in general, health care, schools. All of it's easier because you don't have the big distances. You have the high density, you have the economies of scale and scope. And that's why urbanization is a basic part of a development process and why it's not that I have any expertise to say you'll be 75% urban. I have uh, just a general uh, reason to, to, to know that that's the kind of trend that uh, is the is the natural pattern. So yes, there will continue to be people living in rural areas. They will tend to be somewhat poorer, by the way. They will tend to have a little bit less access to services. They will not have some of the benefits of urban areas, but they may like the quiet, or that's where they grew up, or uh, whatever, the, or because they remain farmers or uh, other rural-based activities. But it won't be the majority of the country. And then the question is, what to do about that? Well, one obvious point to do about that is urban, urban design and planning, which is a skill that is not easy and is very important. And don't make your cities look like, I mean, what you don't want is to live in traffic jams for the next century. <laughs> and so with a little bit of strategy on transportation, it's avoidable. 
and you don't want an automobile-based city. And almost surely, in the next 30 years, transport's going to be electric vehicles. It's not going to be internal combustion engines, so don't build a lot of gas stations. Because there are not going to be needs for gas stations, but there will be needs for charging stations. So thinking ahead of what the infrastructure will look like, what the size of the population will be, how the environment can be managed, how water supply can be managed, how coastlines can be managed, how waste can be recycled, is all part of sophisticated urban planning. And a good, strong urban planning department will be extremely important. Mr. Charles Young, who is a student in the Faculty of Law, will present a token of appreciation to Professor Jeffrey Sachs. All right, Mr. Sachs, on behalf of everyone. Oh, clo closer. <laughs> All right, so on behalf of everyone in the audience today, I'd like to thank you for making your presentation. It was very informative and it had some riveting and bold comments, such as the rich countries have to pay because uh, they cause the problems. Yes. Donald's, Donald Trump <laughs> standing. Yeah, uh, and your, your solutions and recommendations are also innovative and pragmatic, and I feel like they're, how do I say this? I feel like they're good suggestions for transforming the economic dilemma of uh, countries that are struggling. And uh, your suggestion that we move towards a insurance-based system is indicative of that. So again, I just want to thank you again for your presentation and on behalf of everyone, of course, and myself. Thank you.